So it's fun to be uh, here presenting. I think other than doing my vocational comments a few years ago when I joined the club, I don't think I've ever been the program. So that's pretty exciting. And as Jim mentioned, I am co-presenting today with my new friend, Alejandra Palinka. And we are going to each present a little bit of this. I guess that's what co-presenting means. Um, so I will start by introducing, providing a more full introduction for Alejandra because she will be speaking uh, first on the substantive part of our program. So Alejandra, or Ale, Palinka, was appointed Bloomington's first director of creative placemaking and engagement in May. In this newly created city staff position, she has two major roles. On the creative placemaking side of the job, she will help the city identify art, culture, and design investments that will best support the evolution of a distinctive, walkable, urban, did you all get all those adjectives? Distinctive, walkable, urban neighborhood in Bloomington's South Loop and build its regional brand. On the community engagement side, she will work citywide to ensure that all of Bloomington's increasingly diverse stakeholders have a place at the table and a voice and a role in the work and the play that make this city great. Ale is uniquely suited to excel in both parts of her job. She came to the city from a very successful tenure as the executive director of the Northeast Minneapolis Artists, Northeast Minneapolis Artists Association. Arts. Oh, it is arts, yep. NEMA for short. Um, there, she was responsible for general management and for NEMA's regionally acclaimed events, including one that I'm guessing many of you have heard of, Artaworld, which she grew to become the largest open studio tour in the country. Ale has also worked for the Ames Center, previously known as the Burnsville Performing Arts Center, as art gallery director and for Intermedia Arts in Minneapolis as a volunteer coordinator. My favorite credential of all is that, and I'm really jealous, Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine named Ale one of 26 local scene shapers who are integral to making the Minnesota art scene tick. So here she is, scene shaper, Alejandra yeah, Palenka. Thank, <laughs> wow. thank you so much, Andrea. It's been so wonderful to come into this position and have um, partners in place like Artistry who have put forth so much effort and knowledge um, into creating my position and this plan. So it's been wonderful. Um, as Andrea mentioned, I am still, I feel very new to the position. I started at the beginning of June. And so I've had pretty limited experience on presenting. So just <laughs> bear with me here. Um, it's, it's really an honor to be in this position. I can't tell you, this is a perfect blend for me of community engagement and using the arts to really transform and to support a community. So it's been wonderful. Um, so I'm just going to start out a little bit telling you about the South Loop. Um, so first, what I want to talk about, what's very important, is the South Loop is a district within Bloomington, and that's where the creative placemaking um, efforts that we have are concentrated. And so the district is really a center for business and employment, and it's connected to the Twin Cities metro area um, with adjacent freeways, as you can see here, and convenient transit. Um, also, obviously, to global centers via the Minneapolis um, International Airport. It's also home to the Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge and Visitor Center, which is really a huge amenity. Um, so you can see here, these are the borders that surround the South Loop District. And home to Mall America. And home to Mall America. How could I forget that? That was on. And here we are kind of talking about some of the major assets and opportunities. So obviously you can see the airport, the Mall of America, um, light rail and bus, and so forth. And over the next 40 years, two thirds of Bloomington's growth potential will be realized in the South Loop District. So there's tremendous opportunity for growth here. Um, and of course, the vision includes mixed land use that supports additional streets to enhance circulation, higher densities of jobs and homes close to four light rail stations just within this district, and sustainable development practices that save money and support growth. Um, so as you can see here, in an average day projected um, in 2020, there will be 6,000 residents, 9,000 hotel guests, 35,000 employees, and 115,000 Mall of America visitors. And many of you may know this, but I was actually informed by Mall of America that it is the largest tourist des destination in the country, um, surpassing even Walt Disney World and the Grand Canyon, which is a really interesting fact to me. 
So the South Loop vision and uh, the South Loop district plan was actually adopted by the City Council in August of 2013. And as you can see here, it's the vision is really to transform a dispersed suburban commercial area into a walkable urban neighborhood that attracts residents, office tenants, hotel guests, and shoppers by virtue of its unique characters and assets. Um, the, there are four or overarching goals that provide a framework for achieving the South Loop District's vision. And um, this is just talking about one of them, but one of them is to build on the district's unique mix of assets, which we talked about, uh, transform the district's amenities and, or I'm sorry, densities and character from suburban to urban. So you can see here, become more urban and pedestrian focused. Also to accelerate the district's development, to establish and promote the district as a branded place, emphasizing sustainability, quality, safety, and comfort, and within that, establishing, um, as Andrea mentioned, what's really important is a distinct um, identity and sense of place. So in creative placemaking, um, this, this field will actually really help us accomplish these South Loop District goals. So it's an approach that can really inform current and potential developers, um, as well as existing residents and people who work there on where the South Loop is, what it is. Um, so obviously branding is a huge component of that. And work with them on the development vision in different ways. And I'll pass it over to Andrea who will go more into what that means. So um, honest show of hands, before reading about this presentation, how many of you had heard the phrase creative placemaking? Okay, about half, um, which doesn't surprise me at all. It's admittedly a really jargony phrase. So I'm gonna spend a couple minutes talking about um, what is this thing, creative placemaking, exactly? And then we'll, we'll talk about its connection to the South Loop and as Alejandra said, how this emerging field of creative placemaking can help us as a community, help the city achieve its vision for the South Loop. So as this slide says, it is an emerging field. It's a cross-disciplinary field. It brings together, of course, artists, uh, arts administrators, designers, architects, other creative professionals, but also um, disciplines like community development, um, history, planning, uh, a wide variety of fields coming together, all of us focused on building vibrant, distinctive, and sustainable communities and economies using the arts as a vehicle to do that. And there are many, many great examples throughout the country and in our own metropolitan region of creative placemaking that has, has really uh, been a great vehicle for these goals. So a few more words about it. Um, this whole notion of what it means to build a community. I see I left off a close quotes after place. Nothing like editing as you go. Um, creative placemaking grounds this activity of community building um, in a particular place, tries to be responsive to the history of that place, the particular opportunities of a place. Uh, as I've talked about already, it engages community through the arts and it furthers holistic community development through a cross-sector approach, as I mentioned. How can creative placemaking um, advance the South Loop vision and goals that Alejandra talked about? I mean, again, we're, we're talking about, and, and you really have to use a bit of imagination, let's be honest, you really have to use a bit of imagination right now in order, in order to kind of think about what is currently there uh, and to project yourself into the future and see this entire district, this neighborhood, as a place where people come to explore, gather, and linger in an environment that actually invites walking and street level activity. So now if you go back to the prior slides where I was talking about art and artists, and we have more examples of this in a minute, I think it's pretty logical. You can see how incorporating art, whether it's permanent projects like sculpture or artistic events and activities, can certainly advance this goal of making a place a place you want to go and explore, linger, um, a place with distinct identity and character. Hopefully that's not too far of a leap to see the connection there. So now I'll give you some really fun examples of some projects that have been done in some other places, again, that really <coughs> give you a picture of the kinds of things that would make you remember a neighborhood, that would make you want to go and spend time there, um, that would make it distinctive, and again, a place that's fun to linger. So I, I trust you all can read. I don't have to necessarily read these uh, thought experiments here, but we'll just walk through these slides.
ah, for me, this is like the holy grail. I'll tell you why. What if artists lived and worked in the South Loop? Um, this is going to be a little harder to figure out, I think, in a lot of ways, uh, certainly than just placing sculpture, interesting sculpture or murals in the South Loop. The reason that those of us who are working on this creative placemaking project are so interested in this question is that I firmly believe, since one of our goals is to create vibrancy and life, uh, sort of a street level life and vitality, and hopefully also a little spontaneity, which is with no offense to my friends with the city of Bloomington who are here, not always what cities are known for, um, or, or you know that cities necessarily figure out ways to create spontaneity. Uh, but one of the things that we're trying to do is to see this type of, of culture organically spring up in the South Loop. And the best way to do that, in my opinion, is to invite artists to live and work in an area. So we'll keep working at this, see, see if there's a, a way to make that happen. So now we're going to do a little quiz for you. You can see creative placemaking in action. Um, where is this? You all know that. It's the bean. Where is this? It is the city of brotherly love, also known as Philadelphia. Okay, so not quite as, not quite as um, recognizable. How about this? A great Midwestern city known for its arts and culture. Yeah, right, St. Paul. I said St. Paul. Okay, the, the bonus point, where is this? It's here. Yeah, it is the, um, oh my gosh, I'm actually blanking on the name. Thank you, Bloomington Central Station Park. Um, uh, it is a, a beautiful, architecturally interesting place to go take a brown bag lunch or uh, just spend some time there, right here in our own city, in the South Loop, in fact. So, uh, as I said, I don't think it's too much of a stretch. Hopefully it's, it's fairly logical to see how investments in arts and culture can help to accomplish some of these goals around distinctiveness, memorable place, a place you want to linger, uh, walkability. But there's a bonus when you invest uh, as a community in creative placemaking, and that is that these investments have been shown again and again to spur economic growth com and community growth. So the arts in Minnesota, uh, result in over one billion in economic impact or have over one uh, billion in economic impact annually. And here are some specific levers that the arts push. So when you attract businesses, visitors, and residents, encouraging consumer spending by having these kinds of activities going on in your community. Uh, you encourage business relocation and job creation by enhancing the market appeal of an area. Uh, and there's a quote there from Megatrends, whatever Megatrends is. I've heard of it, I have no idea. Thanks, Sully, for putting this <laughs> slide together. Uh, and, to, and to drive tourism as well. Here's an interesting statistic or fact. Cultural tourists spend more money than the average traveler. So people who are traveling or visiting a place um, and drawn there uh, through an arts and culture activity are higher spending. So now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about specifically here in Bloomington, the creative placemaking in the South Loop project and what is its history and Alejandra is going to talk a bit about where it's going from here. Um, Alejandra mentioned that the South Loop district plan was adopted in 2013, which was a, uh, the same time the year that the city of Bloomington plus artistry plus the Mall of America and other partners uh, pursued a quite major grant and got it from the National Endowment for the Arts to do this work. And this is maybe a good time for me to pause with a little bit of an infomercial and just remind you, notwithstanding the bio that was in the rib, so we, my organization, our organization changed its name to Artistry uh, in July of last year? Yeah, 15. Seems like years ago. Anyway, we are separate from the city of Bloomington. So I'm up here and I'm talking about Alejandra and I'm looking at Larry and Diane and I you know, talk sort of fast and loose about you know, my friends and colleagues in the city because we work very closely together, but we are separate. Artistry is a 501c3 nonprofit. We have our own board of directors. We do our own fundraising, our own programming. Um, but we really believe that as a result of this public-private partnership, we're able to do some great things with the city. So. Creative placemaking in the South Loop is an example of a, of a joint initiative or a public-private partnership. And again, the seed funding for this project 
uh, came in 2013 when we uh, pursued the National Endowment for the Arts grant, and it was a matching grant. And I would also like to take this moment to recognize and acknowledge Kurt Hagen in the back of the room. Um, our, our friends at the Mall of America have been incredible partners in this creative placemaking effort and just in general. So Bloomington is very fortunate to have this particular corporate citizen. So thank you to Kurt and your colleagues. Um, other partners, I would just mention McGough uh, has been very helpful um, and forward thinking in this work. Uh, the Bloomington Convention and Visitors Bureau the Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge. Um, they were some of our early, kind of early adopter partners who came on board. So when we pursued this National Endowment for the Arts funding in 2013, we had a number of goals and they are listed here on the slide. And again, I know you can read, but this print is a little bit smaller. So for the people in the back, um, of course, as we've been talking about throughout our presentation today, we were interested in finding ways to transform the South Loop in line with the city vision for the district and to raise its regional profile. So throughout uh, MSP, greater MSP, to have the South Loop be a branded place uh, that, that had positive associations for people. To integrate art and artists into the South Loop, including into public infrastructure. Uh, to change city paradigms about private development and public infrastructure. Um, for us as a nonprofit organization to find ways to diversify and grow our audiences uh, and our visibility, which is to say we wanted to find ways to take art to the streets, literally, um, not to be confined solely to what we do in this building and ask people to come to us, but to actually get art and artists out into the community, uh, which is something that, that has been an ongoing um, process for us over a number of years. And then for both the city and artistry, and I think for our partners as well, to build capacity to continue this placemaking work over the long term once the National Endowment for the Arts funding um, was used. Andrew, before you leave that slide, yeah. you should notice the picture in the center there, that little mural, is something that the Snyders very generously gave to the city. Oh. Yes, indeed. Actually, we have the Schneiders um, in many respects to thank for the existence of the Bloomington Center for the Arts, on which the, uh, the mural denotes that part of this facility or this building, which is the Bloomington Center for the Arts. So this is a, a fabulous time to thank Alan and Debbie again for making that possible. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Bob, for pointing that out. Oh, that's another little infomercial. Um, when we rebranded, the Bloomington Center for the Arts did not go away. The name, the Bloomington Center for the Arts, is alive and well. It's the name of this facility. And again, we are one of seven arts nonprofits based here in the building. So one of several uh, goals on our part in rebranding was to distinguish or help people understand that we're a tenant, a nonprofit organization based here, along with, um, with numerous other great organizations. So what has been done um, with this National Endowment for the Arts funding and the matching uh, funds and in-kind support that we're committed? We, the, the National Endowment for the Arts funding had two major parts to it, or two objectives that we were trying to accomplish. One objective was to commission a series of demonstration projects, and I have some great photos of those that I'll, I'll um, scoot through pretty quickly in a minute. Uh, and then there was a, a planning and a capacity building component that I'll talk about after we get past through these, get past uh, the demonstration projects. And do feel free to ask questions as we go along too, that's great. So um, our first project was actually a, a charrette, which is again a kind of a jargony term, would be familiar to people in planning and design. Uh, it's bringing people together to talk about the future of an area and what could happen. Uh, we had a quote-unquote quote discovery charrette in the South Loop, and it was five or so days of tours and brainstorming and acquainting artists and other stakeholders in the area with what the South Loop was, what were its assets and its possibilities and its challenges. And you are seeing here a guided tour that we took with staff from the Wildlife Refuge, which was a, a great tour, just trying to get to know the area again and think creatively about what could happen there. Uh, I hope many of you, I'm sure not all of you, but I hope many of you have had a chance to see this completed mural. It's in a out of the way, uh, but yet kind of well-traveled uh, place to some. Uh, it is at the trailhead for the bass ponds, if I get this right. 
uh, that are part of the Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge. So it's also, it's right at Cyprus, where, where Cyprus is and the Bass Ponds entrance is right there. And the theme, appropriately enough, appropriately enough for that location, is the confluence of science and nature. Um, and it has some very well-known uh, Bloomington figures. Um, the founder of, gosh, Larry, help me with this one. Um, Ed Crozier, with a, uh, associated with the refuge, but also the gentleman from the tech, right, um, Bill, Bill Norris from Control Data, thank you. So this is a good example of, of what, of creative placemaking at its best because it's not just any mural, it's a mural that celebrates something that is specific to this place. And that's where the placemaking part of creative placemaking comes in. Oh, and by the way, speaking of the mural uh, on this building, you might recognize the style. Um, this is by Eric Pearson, who is the same artist who did the mural for this, the building, the Center for the Arts. Little Box Sauna. Um, this is, in fact, some of the people in this room, uh, at least a couple of us. Huh, maybe I'm the only person in this room in a white bathrobe standing in front of the little, the, the little box sauna, which exactly as the name says, was a portable uh, sauna. I like the phrase mobile hotspot in connection with this. And it was installed for a couple of weeks at Radisson Blue outside the Mall of America. And then it had another uh, short stint at Ikea. And exactly as it looks, it was a little sauna, a little transportable sauna that people could go and sit in, ideally with people they had never met before. The idea being, you're gonna meet people and have conversations in a setting like this that would never otherwise happen. So full of spontaneity, uh, lots of fun, and it has gone on to have quite a bit of coverage throughout the Twin Cities. It was born here in Bloomington. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get a whole lot of coverage for it, but let me tell you, uh, this little box sauna has traveled around the Twin Cities uh, since this commission and, and tends to get plenty of media play where it goes. So the artists behind this are two architecture professors at the University of Minnesota, and they're the ones standing there without the bathrobes. This was the, the day we, uh, we the, the sort of the ribbon cutting for it. Yes, Deb. Um, I kind of get this whole thing, which is very cool, and I know like the North Loop and stuff is uh, really artsy and, and so forth, but I think part, part of my confusion is um, there's a lot more denser population mm -hmm. in North Minneapolis where this kind of stuff is happening. And there's only, according to your first slide, there's only 6,000 residents. So who's going to be doing this walk-in stuff? It seems to me that this works where people walk out of mm -hmm. their condo down the way and there's restaurants and bars and all kinds of fun stuff. You know who? I mean, if you're going to go shopping, you're not going for. A, I don't know. I mean, maybe you are. So the South or like a sauna. How do you show up and just you know? Like yeah, it's it's going to get a lot more dense. I mean, six thousand residents may not sound like a lot objectively, but when you think about the area in which it is, you also think about all the workers who are there every day. Um, the the challenge for us in this project is that it's ahead of its time and that's on purpose. I mean, so the idea was to demonstrate how certain things could be done with the idea that you gain some interest and some momentum, you start drawing some attention to an area and that you can, you can bring certain dreams into reality by modeling what you would like to see going on in a sense. So it was hard to do this project um, at this time because you're right, the density is not there yet and so I think this is also why we had a hard time getting traction again with some media coverage and some other some other things. So it's uh, it's also the why they were called demonstration projects. Again, you know what can we demonstrate? And we learned a lot. I mean, the, I, here I will say I think colleagues of the city, certainly within our organization too, learned a lot about what it takes to do these kinds of projects. Just sort of regulations and ordinances that can either help or hurt. Um, the, the going forward of artist-led initiatives like this in the future. So it was really kind of setting the table is maybe a good way to think about it and, and learning what we could about how to do this work going forward. Walking theater at the Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, we had a, I mean, I don't even know how to describe this. Did anyone here, at, who attended the performance at the refuge other than Larry? Okay, Larry and Rachel. It was, it was pretty great. It was a free outdoor series of performances 
um, true community theater. The people who were engaged were stakeholders in the South Loop, um, residents, people who worked there in some cases, people who did come from some other communities too who were just interested in the project. It was an original musical theater production written based on the history of the refuge um, and the potential of the refuge and uh, it was great. We obviously, or as you might expect, we did a lot of events uh, over the period of time that we were launching this. So um, events that would bring together the artists who were being commissioned and then various hosts, host sites in the South Loop. And then I am ending, I think on this, yep, ending on the demonstration projects. This really has an asterisk on it. It's, there's an invisible asterisk. The name of the sculpture is Convergence. It's at 28th Avenue and, and Lindau Lane. Uh, hopefully many of you have seen it. It's especially beautiful at night. It has a programmed set of, LC, of LED lights uh, that slowly change color. Uh, it's very beautiful. It's by a person who happens to be a Bloomington native, Jim Brenner, uh, now still based in Minneapolis. And these are some pictures from the, the opening or the unveiling that we had last August. It has an asterisk because it wasn't really funded. It wasn't really part of the NEA funded launch, uh, but it came immediately on the heels of it and is certainly um, a, a beautiful permanent sculpture installation in the South Loop that will um, bring interest and delight, I think, for many people for years to come. So as I mentioned, the demonstration projects were the first major part of the grant. Uh, the other piece was about uh, capacity building and planning. And so, um, Last year in July, the City Council and the Artistry Board adopted a creative placemaking in the South Loop plan. The plan was informed by what we learned through the demonstration projects uh, and by studying what had happened in other communities as well. Our focus was to keep the momentum going, um, to set aside funding from the South Loop Development Fund uh, for future commissions. It established a creative placemaking commission or paved the way for that, which Alejandra is gonna talk about and created a new city staff position, Alejandra's position. So now I'm handing it back over. Um, so City of Bloomington, um, so my complete title is a little bit of a mouthful, but it, I think it does describe um, what I am about pretty well. So it's Director of Creative Placemaking and Engagement. And so as you can read up there, I'm really helping to identify the art, culture, and design investments um, that will support the evolution of the South Loop District, um, build the brand, and facilitate the work of the commission. Um, also work with partners in the city um, and stakeholders to evaluate and to implement the creative placemaking plan. And then the engagement side of my role, which is actually more uh, city-based throughout the whole city, whereas creative pla placemaking efforts are based within South Loop for now. Hopefully we hope to expand those throughout Bloomington in future years. Um, the engagement side of my role is really integrated into the city's various departments and strategic planning efforts. Um, it's also supporting community engagement priorities, which I can answer questions on if there's more on that. Um, so in terms of what projects are, are really being worked on right now, um, so or have been completed, um, Town Place Suites has, I believe, one sculpture and one on the way um, that have been privately invested by the company with, with our support. And right now we're investing in an art gate project, um, which is just kind of being finalized in terms of details, which should be pretty beautiful within that space. Um, we also are finalizing details and contracts on utility uh, box wraps. So you may have seen these throughout the city of Minneapolis or maybe in Uptown. Generally, it's a vinyl wrapping that covers those big green kind of metal utility boxes. Um, and we have three sets of boxes, each by different artists. And so the nice thing about these is that they actually incorporate this one right here, for example, um, is actually painted directly onto the box, so it's very unique. And they'll have small little scul sculptural components on the sides, little mini fire hydrants, benches, and things like that. So it really makes it stand out from the traditional wraps that you see. So each set is very different. And again, as Andrea mentioned, it really just invites a sense of discovery. And you know, as you're kind of walking through or driving through the South Loop to see this as an unexpected pop of art, I think, really makes it more welcoming. Um, some things that we're in the talks of, not specifically planning, but have been talking a lot about is the Mall of America Transit Station and its redevelopment and how we can make sure that creative placemaking and wayfinding finds its way within that planning. Um, a Super Bowl project and a landform project, which will be perhaps on the medians within the area on Killebrew, um, outside of the Radisson Blue area. 
So the last thing I want to just make sure to touch on is the Creative Placemaking Commission. So the deadline, we are accepting applications through August 31st. Um, it's obviously a newly formed commission. And so stakeholders, I mean, this is such a broad field. It really could encompass anyone from South Loop, uh, Bloomington residents and businesses. Um, we really are looking for diverse representation and a background and maybe if you know or are interested in you could be public art or urban planning architecture community outreach um, equity and inclusion artists etc so um, I won't take too much time to read through these but these are just some of the things that the creative placemaking commission will be in charge of um, we do have staggered terms that will be available there will be nine commissioners three of them will be appointed by artistry and six by the city of bloomington five of nine of the commissioners do have to be um, citizens of bloomington and that was intentional and unlike maybe most of the commissions because we did want to invite outside expertise within this commission if you didn't necessarily live here but if you did have a strong interest in creative placemaking or maybe worked here Okay, so I wanted to end on time, so I just didn't know if you have any questions for us, but that about wraps it up. Take one question. Sure. Do we have one question? Yes. So did we not, did Larry, I thought you presented a while ago about kind of doing the same thing like at 82nd and Penn or something. Is that, is this kind of like that or? Larry might be able to answer that. So you're talking about the Fresh Time grocery store. Well, that whole area. And and the at the same time that we were working on placemaking in the South Loop, the developer at Fresh Time said, I'd like to do something like that on my grocery building. And so the same people at the city and artistry who were working on the uh, creative placemaking also uh, advised United Properties on uh, that placemaking. It's the council's objective to extend placemaking to the whole city. And it's in their strategic plan. The thing is, we have to get momentum going in the South Loop first, and so we think that it's 2018 or 19 before we really have the capacity to uh, move on to the rest of the city for placemaking, with the exception of an individual developer who wants to carry on. Okay, thank you to thank our you. speakers. Yeah, Bob? Well, Larry talked, and you should realize he's kind of one of the unsung heroes of all this stuff. And has probably done as much for this creative placemaking and general long term planning of city building as anybody. Yes, you're here. Yes, yes. Larry Lee. <laughs> he's a humble man, as most Rotarians are. Andrea, thank you and Alejandra for updating us on the culture in Bloomington.